right now, so I'll be here amongst friends and talk a little bit about Japanese politics. Um, it's a participatory lecture today. I want you all to look at your zippers. I know it sounds weird. Look at your zippers and see what they say on them. <laughs> look at your zippers. Come on. Look at your zippers. What do they say on them? Yeah. Oh, you need me to use the microphone? Uh oh, I'm going to be. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I like to walk around. All right, what do your zippers say on them? Raise your hands. What does yours say? YKK. How many of you have YKK on your zippers? That many of you have YKK on your zippers. Now, some of you obviously knew about this, right? You, do you know what YKK stands for, anybody? No, you just know that zippers have YKK on them. YKK stands for Yoshida Kogyo Kabushiki Kaisa. It's a Japanese company that makes zippers. Okay, Yoshida is the name of the man, the family name of the man who set up the company. Right, Kogyo Kabushiki Kaisa is, you know, like an industrial corporation or something like that. Okay. Not surprising. You didn't realize, though, that the Japanese, not only have they penetrated the automobile market, they've taken over the zipper market. Now, what do zippers have to do with reform in Japan? Good question, huh? Why are we talking about zippers? Um, in 1972, three young politicians were first elected to the Japanese Diet. That's their version of Congress. That's their name for it. Um, one of them was 35 years old. His name was Yamasaki Taku. Another of them was 33 years old. His name was Kato Koichi. And the third one was 30 years old. His name was Koizumi Junichiro. Do you see a pattern there? Yamasaki Kato Koizumi. Their name, Matt, is YKK. So the Japanese press have picked up on that. And since then, they've been talking about this trio as the YKK politicians. Not because they have anything to do with zippers, just because everybody in Japan knows about YKK too, and so it made sense. It's a pun. The Japanese love to do puns, so do the Koreans. Um, you, you stop and say to yourself, these three people were elected in 1972, well, what's significant about that? First, notice how young they were, right? Koizumi Junichiro, he's now the Prime Minister of Japan, right? He was first elected when he was 30 years old, right? Uh, Rick Santorum was elected to the Senate in Pennsylvania. I think he was like 33. But all of these guys were elected in their early 30s. And you may say to yourself, how does somebody that young get elected? Well, two of them, Koizumi Junichiro and Kato Koichi, replaced their fathers. That's another point about Japanese politics. In Japan, your father holds a seat, has a campaign machine that helps him get elected. He dies or retires and passes that campaign machine on to his son. And there is probably 20, 25% of Japan's politicians are hereditary politicians, people who inherited their seats from their fathers. Now, we have that phenomenon in the United States, right? I mean, you just have to be somehow related to the Kennedy family, and that gives you a leg up. Oh my gosh, our senator from Utah, Senator Bennett, is the son of a former senator from Utah. So it happens but not nearly to the extent that it happens in Japan. And the other crucial characteristic about her hereditary politicians is that they are well-placed to become the most powerful politicians in the country. You say to yourself, why is that the case? Well, if your political career starts when you're at the age of 30, by the time you're the age of 60, you've got an awful lot of seniority and you've built up your power base, right? You're well-placed. Other less lucky politicians, you know, serve in the city assembly, serve in the prefectural assembly, right? Enter politics through another method, and they may not get first elected until they're 45, right? So they don't have the opportunity to get the seniority and the connections and work their way into the political world as easily as some of these hereditary politicians do. So it's interesting to note that three of these YKK politicians, two of the three, were hereditary politicians. Um, they're now 60, 63, and 65, Sort of prime age for political power, but that's after having served 30 years in the Japanese diet. Now, what does this have to do with reform? I'm going to talk a lot of stuff, and we're not going to get to the reform question, which is the topic of, that I'm supposed to be talking about until right at the end. But what does this have to do with reform? These three have always been seen as reformers. 
They were part of the Japanese ruling political party. It's called the Liberal Democratic Party. It's a relatively conservative party, um, middle of the road and conservative. It sort of spans the spectrum, has the conservatives and the people in the center, too. They were always seen as reformers, not because they were like John McCain-type politicians. They weren't out to, you know, change everything around, turn the world upside down. They were just young. And they had ideas. And it always looked like whenever you were going to try to do something in the LDP, you always pinned your hopes on the rising generation. The people not in power yet, but, you know, when the old guys retire, they'll move up into the ranks and they're younger and they have these new ideas and they're going to make something with it. The other reason that these three, the YKK politicians, were associated with reform was because their opponents within the LDP, perhaps I'll call it that, the other groups that held power in the LDP were seen as corrupt, money-tainted, influence-peddling politicians. The most famous of these is a man named Tanaka Kakue, who was the prime minister in the 1970s. He was toppled by the Lockheed scandal. Right? The Lockheed Corporation wanted a Japanese airline to buy some of their airplanes rather than a different company's airplanes, and they paid large sums of money to Tanaka as essentially a fee so that Tanaka would put pressure on the corporation to um, purchase the, the airplanes from the American company, from Lockheed. That's not why Tanaka was kicked out of office. He was kicked out of office for other scandals. That's the one we all know about because it involved the United States. But Tanaka was... By our standards, a very corrupt politician, a man who accepted large sums of money from corporations to do favors for them. Okay. This, however, as you're going to find out, is not an uncommon practice in Japan. <laughs> it sounds horrible from our perspective, but um, there are some scholars that argue that it, in Japan this is structural corruption. It's just the way the system operates. Um, Chalmers Johnson actually argues that it's essentially a tax. You know, you have to pay about a 3% bribe to the politicians to get something through, and corporations in Japan just factor that into their calculations. Okay? Sort of like soft money, right? We have soft money here. People argue about it being corrupt, but everybody does it, right? If you're going to be successful in politics, you do it. In Japan, getting these contributions for helping corporations get government contracts, things like that, is... Uh, close to standard operating procedure. A lot of people do it. But Tanaka was the king of this. He could get huge sums of money, more than anyone else. And even when he was toppled by scandal, because he had so much access to money and had so many politicians that relied on him to get money, he continued to run Japanese politics from behind the scenes. He was later replaced by one of his lieutenants, a man named Takeshita Noboru, and his friend, Kane Marushin. And my favorite story about Kane Marushin is when he was actually arrested for corruption pr charges. He actually got in trouble and was arrested. When the police came through and searched his house, there were millions of dollars of stock certificates, gold bullion, <laughs> cash. I was sort of cash on hand at the Kanemaru household, <laughs> okay? And the reason why it was in the form of gold and stock certificates and cash is when you're taking illegal, you know, kickbacks from corporations, you can't trace it. You can't put it in your bank account. So you've got to keep it at home. So he just had large sums of money around his house. And that, you know, it wasn't like he brought it in that day to get caught. That was just happened to be what was on hand when the police happened to come through, okay? Um... Since then, the, the, the successors in this line are um, the current prime minister, Koizumi's main opponent, a man named Hashimoto Ryutaro, and Ozawa Ichiro, who also it comes out of the same line. So you have the YKK politicians over here contrasted with this line of politicians that are very adept at raising money illegally right, and funding their friends' campaigns. Okay. Now, as I said, everybody in Japan, at least within the ruling LDP, engages in this kind of corruption to some degree or another. But you had the really corrupt over here, and then the less corrupt over here. Okay? And so the YKK politicians were always seen as the alternative, the cleaner alternative, the better alternative to the traditional powers that were ruling Japan and that were running the LDP. Now, of these three... The most promising person, if you had asked me three or four or five years ago to bet on which one of the YKK people is going to be 
Prime Minister of Japan, I would have picked Kato Koichi. He's not the Prime Minister right now. Okay? The man who is the Prime Minister is Koizumi. Koizumi is sort of a wild person. In fact, they call him in the Japanese, in his personality and in his looks, he looks, he's just a little offbeat. They call him Ryon Hair because his hair is sort of <laughs> all over. Lion hair. That's the transliteration that he, his hair looks like a lion's hair. It's sort of like a mane, a little bit wavy, and it's sort of up there. I mean, um, so he looks a little offbeat, and he's taken some positions that are a little bit out of the mainstream. Kato Koichi of these three reformers was always seen as the, the better choice, the man who was more well-placed. He had a stronger base within the LDP. He had more allies in the LDP. Ka uh, Koizumi is always a one-man show. He'll offend people. He doesn't care. He'll do what he wants. Okay. So if you'd asked me a couple years ago to bet who, uh, which one of these reformers would, is most likely to be prime minister, I would put Kato. But about two years ago, Kato decided to, to, he was threatening to leave the LDP and join up with the opposition parties. And he maneuvered that way. There was a lot of press that way. And then it fizzled out. And so he sort of became discredited because he sort of spent all his political capital on the possibility of breaking his party apart and joining up with the LDP. How then did Koizumi come to the forefront? Well, I have to step back. About a year ago, a little less than a year ago, Japan's prime minister was a man named Morty. And Morty was... Uh, typical of the old line politicians, right? He'd been put on by the powers that be, and he was enormously unpopular. Um, he was unpopular with foreigners because when he was education minister, he said that the reason why American students performed so poorly was because we had all of those minorities. And, you know, when you've got minorities, no wonder your performance drops down. The interesting thing about that statement is, is the Japanese press didn't even pick up on it. It's like, whatever. And when the um, foreign reporters picked up on it, then it became an issue, and then he was forced to resign. I actually remember Professor Watabe was telling me that when Morty came to visit BYU, were, you were not personally impressed with him either. <laughs> so <laughs> the negative reaction of the Japanese people is supported by Professor Watabe. <laughs> okay. um, Pr Prime Minister Morty was enormously unpopular for a lot of things. The discussion of uh, his gaffe about, you know, um, American schools having problems and things like that. That, that is all, um, that's just a long line of bad things that he said, things that have upset people. The, the crowning blow came right before he was forced out of office. Do you remember when the American submarine surfaced and sank the Japanese ship? Right, a terrible, terrible mistake by the Americans. Morty made an equally terrible mistake as the prime minister, because when he was told in the middle of his golf game that this tragedy had happened, he insisted on finishing the game. Okay, and then that got played up in the press. Right, probably a bad thing to do if you're a politician when your citizens get killed in a tragic event. Don't play out the round of golf, okay? So Morty managed to offend almost everybody in Japan. And right before he was replaced, his approval rating was at like 14%, 12%, right? Not as bad as Prime Minister Takeshita. Yeah, I mentioned him. In the height of the recruit scandal, his approval rating was 4%. 4%. <laughs> I don't think it's possible to be that low, is it? I mean, don't you have enough relatives <laughs> to get above 4%? Morty was a problem for the LDP. He was extremely unpopular, and it wasn't getting better, right? It just each week he did something to offend somebody else or to embarrass Japan or to embarrass the LDP. And the problem that Japan faced and that the LDP faced is they had an upper house election scheduled in a few months. And if you're a political party, the last thing you want to do is to go into an election with somebody who is going to drag you down. So they decided it was time to switch party presidents and hence prime ministers. And when they sat down to talk about it, it looked like, you know, the parties that be the power brokers within the LDP were going to engineer somebody like themselves to be prime minister. And out of nowhere came Koizumi Junichiro. Okay? He's well known about this YKK stuff. People have always heard about him. When they started to actually ballot for who would be the party president, 
you know, the whole nation doesn't vote. It's the LVP members of the Diet vote. But they also give votes to the party leaders in the provinces, right? You know, like the state party leader and different people like that. Turns out that those people were looking ahead to the election and they said, we're going to get clobbered. We need somebody who's popular. And Koizumi's popular, right? He has a reputation of being part of this reformist group and he has his Zion hair. And, you know, he's straight spoken. He's the perfect kind of politician you'd want to run a campaign on. He wasn't liked by the people who had power and influence within the LDP. But the party bosses at the local level thought this is the man that will help us win an election. And so he won. He won that election within the party, became